Ito starts in about uh, 38 seconds, right? Fifteen seconds. Let it count it down. All right, here we go. We're, uh, second show in the post-Trump world. Uh, we're going to be spending this show uh, analyzing Trump's appointments. He's appointed one, two, three, four, five, five people we know. He's interviewing a lot of people. Now, let me, let me start by saying, and I think those of you who've listened to the show suddenly know this, um, I am not a fan. I'm not a fan of Donald Trump. I'm not a fan of his positions. I am not and those of you who don't know me might not know this, I'm no lefty. I am a principled capitalist. I believe in free market. I believe in the America of the founding fathers, and I think Donald Trump is a travesty. He goes against the principles of the founders and certainly has no, no conception of what a free market looks like, at least not based on his statements, not based on what he said during the campaign. Uh, I am very pro-free pro trade, very pro-immigration, and I know a lot of you are not. I know a lot of you resent that. A lot of you are really, really upset at me. Um, I noticed that at the Freedom Summit when I was there and almost booed off the stage. Um, but hopefully you'll listen. You know, it's about having a debate in this country. It's about listening. And what I want to do today is talk about what the appointments that Donald Trump has made so far say about him and how we think he's going to govern. Uh, are these good appointments, bad appointments? From my perspective, from the perspective of individual rights, from the perspective of capitalism, from the perspective of freedom and freedom. And by the way, you know, my friend Sean uh, has a show on uh, right after me at, at five o'clock. So I hope uh, those of you in Chicago will stay on and listen to him because uh, he'll just add on to everything, I, to what I say. We disagree on some stuff, but mostly we agree. All right. So who, who was appointed this week? Uh, the Trump and the transition team have been very busy, obviously, interviewing lots of people, lots of people coming in and out of the Trump Tower. I was actually in New York uh, this last week, and uh, all the roads surrounding the Trump Tower are blocked off. You, you cannot get there, which creates unbelievable traffic hazard everywhere. And this is what every president, and I guess President-elect does. They don't care. Like when Obama comes to L.A., the city shuts down because the traffic shuts down because they block off all the streets. Uh, we are inconvenienced by those in power. That's part of what it's all about. So it, it, Trump was at Trump Tower. I guess today he's in New Jersey. Uh, today is, uh, is uh, Saturday, and he's, he's interviewing people, talking to people, filling those positions. Uh, and he so far has, uh, has filled five positions. So Reese uh, Priebus, and I I think I'm pronouncing the name right, uh, is his chief of staff at the White House. And I have to admit, I don't know much about Reese Priebus. He's a chairman of the National Republican Committee, has done a, 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 what seems like a pretty good job over the last few years getting Republicans elected. The Republicans control the House, they control the Senate, they've controlled the House and the Senate for quite a while. And from all accounts, he's considered kind of a mainstream conservative. I, I don't think he's a... Uh, He's an out there conservative. I don't think he's a Donald Trump anti-trade, anti-immigration conservative necessarily. Uh, he's been critical of Donald Trump during the campaign, so that's good. I guess it's good to see Trump appoint somebody in his um, in the administration who's been critical of him. We'll get to some others later. Uh, I think that's a good sign that he's not just taking people who have been accolades, just people who've been following him and, and, and being part of his campaign constantly. But Reese also... 
very much supported Donald Trump at the end and, and uh, brought to bear the Republican Party infrastructure in support of, uh, of uh, Trump's uh, election. So I think this is payback for the fact that we s- stood by Trump. And it sounds like he's a good organizer and will be somebody who uh, knows, obviously, as chairman of the Republican Party, he knows everybody in the Republican Party. He'll be the guy, I think, that Trump relies on to bridge to the mainstream, to bridge to a lot of people who opposed his candidacy, who, who did not vote for him within the Republican Party. And so he, he's definitely within the context of a Donald Trump. Seems like I'm a moderate voice. Now, again, I don't know much about his positions. I, I looked him up a little bit, and there's not a lot about what Reese actually stands for. Uh, and and uh, so I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see what kind of advice he gives Donald Trump. And uh, my guess is he's quite involved in uh, selecting the cabinets, and, and uh, some of these choices are going to be a reflection on on Reese and, and certainly on, uh, on Trump. All right, um, so that's Reese. I, the more interesting one, of course, is, is Bannon, is the choice of uh, a Bannon as, uh, I guess, chief strategist, which is kind of a new position, but uh, why not? I mean, uh, it's, um, you know, Trump has, uh, has uh, you know, right to do uh, new things. And uh, he, he, he appointed Steve Bannon as his chief strategist within, within the administration. And I want to talk a little bit about Bannon. Now, if you want to get into the conversation, uh, happy to take your call. 312-642-5600. That's 312-642-5600. Five six zero zero. Call in if you have any comments on Trump, his election. You want to argue with me? You want to you want to defend his appointments when I'm not too happy? Uh, whatever. Give us a call and let us know what you think. Three one two six four two five six zero zero. And you're listening. I'll remind you to the Yaron Brook Show, where we talk about uh, current events from an objectivist perspective, from the perspective of Ein. Rand, free markets, individual rights, and the morality of rational self-interest. We're radicals. I'm a radical. I'm a radical. You know, I think uh, I'm definitely a radical. And, and, you know, I don't think Donald Trump's much of a radical. It's kind of, eh. Anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about Steve Bannon. Now, Steve Bannon's interesting, right? I mean, he's a guy, I find it interesting, uh, kind of funny, I guess, that uh, Steve Bannon started his career at uh, Goldman Sachs. And a number of the people that, uh, that uh, Donald Trump is interviewing uh, come from Goldman Sachs. And Goldman Sachs, of course, has come to represent, justly or unjustly, it has come to represent the ultimate insiders, the cronies. Because every, every secretary of the Treasury, going back quite a while, almost every one of them, has been connected in some way to Goldman Sachs. So it's come to be this insider crony type thing, which Donald Trump was all against. And then, and then a number of these Goldman Sachs guys um, being interviewed. Now, of course, Bannon is no insider, so uh, I, I won't, uh, let's not count the fact that he was once at Goldman Sachs against him or for him. I actually like Goldman Sachs, so to me it counts for him. Um, Bannon is the, is the CEO, or was the, the CEO of, of, uh, of Breitbart, the uh, kind of right, uh, sensationalistic uh, news website uh, that likes to be sensational, that likes to, uh, you know, poke, that likes to, you know, be right there at, at the forefront and likes to get people, get people's attention, even, even at the expense of facts, even at the expense of the truth. Uh, he is definitely a rabble rouser. He's definitely out to poke people. He definitely considers himself uh, to the right, I guess, on, on the spectrum, and I don't even know what the spectrum means anymore, to the right of Donald Trump on a lot of issues, on a lot of issues. Um, many people consider Breitbart and, uh, and uh, Bannon kind of the spokesman, the mouthpiece of the alt-right. Now, I don't know. I, I have to admit, I'm not sure of this. Now, the alt-right, as I see the alt-right, is the alt-right, the real alt-right, a, a nationalist, anti-immigration, Many of them are racists. Many of them are anti-Semites. Um, 
Bannon is, agrees with some of that. He's what he himself has called an economic nationalist. So I don't want to buy into the leftist stuff. I don't know if he's an anti-Semite. I don't know if he's a racist. He's certainly a nationalist because he calls himself a nationalist. And he's certainly this economic nationalist. Well, what does economic nationalism mean? It's basically code word for anti-trade. Uh, code word for bring the jobs home. And, and we, we'll talk about whether you can bring the jobs home and what that even means. Uh, definitely about, you know, penalize companies that leave the country, um, about uh, stopping immigration. So uh, he is part of the alt-right to the extent that there's overlap between his ideas and their ideas. The, the, the hardcore alt-right are neo-Nazis. But he sympathizes with some of their ideas. I don't think he's a neo-Nazi. But, you know, this is the fuzziness, the, 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 the unspecificity of this whole alt-right thing. But suddenly he, again, defines himself as a nationalist. Now, what is a nationalist? What does nationalism mean? And I am not a nationalist. I'm anti-nationalism. Because nationalism means placing the state, placing the nation above the individual. That the standard for good is what's good for the country. And if you as an individual need to be sacrificed for the country, that's okay. Because the standard is what's good for the country. I am anti-nationalism. The founding fathers were anti-nationalism. We are individualists. The individuals first. Government is there to serve us. The state is our servant, not our master. We'll be right back. Sound okay? So those of you in uh, Facebook Live, uh, there's like a three-minute commercial break now, so you're just going to have to wait. coffee
All right, today we're talking about Donald Trump's appointments, uh, the appointments in the White House and to the Cabinet. We've got five appointments. We've covered one. We're in the middle of talking about Steve Bannon. And remember, the context for me is always free markets. The context for me is always freedom. It's individual rights. It's a limited role for government. How does Steve Bannon, how does Donald Trump fit into that context? That's what we're talking about. If you want in on the conversation, 312 642 Five six zero zero three one two six four two five six zero zero. Now, as I said, Bannon was was at the head of Breitbart. He considers himself a nationalist, an economic nationalist, which uh, it, it's clearly he's anti-trade, um, and he's very explicit about being anti-immigration. Not just, and and I know you guys are going to jump on me, illegal immigration, illegal immigration. That's that's what you guys that's what you guys like uh, you know it's as if the whole immigration thing is about illegal immigration it's not Bannon is opposed to much more than just illegal immigration he is opposed to immigration he is opposed and this is where I suspect he really is a racist he is opposed to all these people from all these other cultures coming in even when it's not illegally and and I want to I want to read to you a a conversation. Uh, that Steve Bannon had with Donald Trump. When Donald Trump was running for pre- uh, in a campaign, uh, Steve Bannon has, I guess, a podcast, a radio show, and he was interviewed. He was interviewed on this radio show. And uh, Donald Trump was actually taking the very reasonable position that if somebody gets an education in the United States, a foreigner gets an education in, in, in you know, science or whatever, then you want him to stay in the country. And he says this to Bannon, he says, I'm quoting uh, Donald Trump here, when someone is going to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Penn, Stanford, all the greats, and then they graduate. We throw them out of the country, and they can't get back in, Trump said. I think that's terrible, added Trump, who's a regular on the show, right? We have to be careful of that, Steve. You know, we have to keep our talented people in this country. Wow, I didn't believe, I didn't believe Donald Trump thought that. That's, that's good news about Trump. But Bannon is not having any of this. He's like humming and hawing, and he's, uh, you know, he doesn't really respond. And then he says, then this is what he says. When two-thirds or three-quarters of the CEOs in Silicon Valley are from South Asia or from Asia, I think, and then he stops and he hesitates because he knows he's on delicate ice here, right? He just called, he just complained about CEOs being from South Asia to Asia and he wants to back away from the racism. But then he says, a country is more than economy. We're a civil society. Now, what does that suggest to you? That suggests that he's implying that having, having CEOs, Three quarters to two thirds, which is a false number. But anyway, having those CEOs from South Asia and f- or from Asia in Silicon Valley somehow undercuts civil society. I mean, that's nuts. That's insane. Right? That's crazy. And it's racist. So who cares if the CEOs from Silicon Valley are from South Asia or from Asia, if they're Chinese or Indians? They're producing all the good stuff that we have in this world. They're producing the wonderful technology that we use. The CEO of Microsoft, the CEO of Google right now are Indians, Indian from India. Wow, these are talented, smart, productive, engaged people. We should be celebrating them, not complaining about them. But you see, Bannon doesn't want H-1B visas. He doesn't want legal immigrants. He doesn't want legal immigrants who are incredibly talented. That is very, very dangerous. Very, very bad. Very bad for freedom in this country. Very bad for our economy. We want talent. We want hardworking people. We want people who produce and create and build. That's the kind of people we want in this country. To start excluding them. And this is to those of you who thought this was just about illegal immigration. This is not just about illegal immigration. This is about immigration, period. All right, Benjamin here wants to talk about immigration. Now, go ahead, Benjamin. He's calling from Arkansas. Yes, we are. But Bannon is. Steve Bannon is. Steve Bannon is. I just quoted you a quote from Bannon where it's not about legally. These people are all in the country legally and he doesn't like them. What's that? Yeah, we're... 
repeating it doesn't make it doesn't make you smarter. Um, it, it, I'm all for legal immigration. I just believe that the, the the immigration laws today are stupid or bad. And the fact is that Steve Bannon is against legal immigration. So is Jeff Sessions, by the way. Jeff Sessions wants to do away with H-1Bs. H-1B visas are legal ways to get into the country. And yet, these people want to ban H-1Bs, legal, 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 legal ways to get into the country. That is a bad thing. This You watch, right? Watch what happens. All right. Thanks, Benjamin. I'm here. You wanted to say something? We don't have too much labor. That's complete and utter nonsense. We have a massive shortage of people. Listen to me a second. We have a massive shortage of people to pick apples in Oregon. Nobody's picking apples because they won't allow cheap labor to come in. And we have a massive, massive shortage of engineers in this country. Uh, you know, there's a massive shortage of labor in this country. Well, we have too much of our regulations and taxes and government controls and government restrictions. That's what we have too much of. And you see, you too are anti-immigrant. You're not only anti-illegal immigrant, you're anti-immigrant. And this is what I suspect of most of you Trump fans. It's not just about the legality. You don't want more people to come to this country, even if they're productive, even if they get a job, even if they work hard. You just don't want them. And that is not a good thing. That is anti-American. It's anti-what this country is about. And well, I appreciate that. <laughs> but I'm taking somebody's job. There's a shortage of jobs. I came illegally. I came legally. And so do so do so do all the guys in Silicon Valley that Bannon is complaining about. Right, Benjamin? I just read your direct quote from Bannon. No, I didn't make it up. Good. If you were, if you were the president's strategic advisor, then I would be a little bit more calm. But it's Steve Bannon, and he doesn't agree with you. Thanks, Benjamin. Really appreciate the call. Keep on listening. And I appreciate the fact that you want me to stay in this country because at the Freedom Summit, a number of people wanted to uh, deport me as soon as possible. Luckily, I'm not an American citizen, and I can't do that. <laughs> All right, we got Kevin on the line. Uh, from Scottsdale, Arizona. Man, we've got a very, uh, we've got a listenership all over the country now. Uh, Kevin, you're in your own book show. What's up? Good. Good. Okay. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna miss Bush by the time Trump is done. You're gonna miss Bush. Okay, I I get I, I I'm running out of time. We've got a commercial break hitting, so let me just say this. I get it. I I get what you're saying. I get the hatred of Hillary Clinton. I really do. I hate Hillary Clinton. Maybe not as much as you got as you do and many others do, but I hate Hillary Clinton. I hate Obama, but I I hate Bush as much as I hate Obama, and 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 I know that's shocking to many of you, but I do. I know. What, uh, how much damage a Republican like Bush can do and, and uh, what kind of damage he did in 2008 and what kind of damage he did in Iraq and Afghanistan and what kind of damage he did to, to young men like you uh, who, who went into the military. But I, I, I think Trump is actually going to be worse. But more importantly, I think that I think we don't know what he's going to be. 
And that's what's scary. Now, you voted for him primarily because you voted against Hillary. I'm worried about, not you, I'm worried about the voters who voted for Trump because they love Trump. That scares me. That really, really scares me. Okay, you're listening to the Ron Brooks Show. Kevin, really appreciate you calling. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to talk about national defense in a minute. We'll be right back. Say hi to Sean for me. Tell him I gave him the show a plug. All right, this break is actually long. It's another four minutes. Yeah, Kevin's a good guy. Two and a half, uh, two and a half minutes. One more minute, guys. Minute eight.
All right, we're back, and we're talking about Donald Trump's appointments. And uh, just thought it kind of tried to talk about Stephen Bannon, but uh, you know, got caught up in the whole immigration thing. Let me be clear: Stephen Bannon is against, wants to shrink dramatically legal immigration into this country. That it would be a disaster, a disaster. Now I, I'm going to get Nathaniel's on the line, and I'm going to get to Nathaniel. I just want to cover a few more points on Bannon. Otherwise, I'm not going to cover anything this show, right? You guys are, are way getting very excited, but it's good. Keep on calling, 312-642-5600. I love it when you call, 312-642-5600. So Bannon is, based on everything I can see, he's an economic nationalist. He's anti-trade. I've already talked on this show many times about trade. I'll talk about trade to Nathaniel in a little bit. He's anti-immigration, legal as well as illegal. He's borderline racist. Uh, that what he said about Asian, uh, you know, uh, Silicon Valley CEOs, horrible stuff. Um, he is very religious, at least the way he talks, all about the judo Christian, judo Christian, judo Christian. He's very anti Ayn Rand. He actually talks about Ayn Rand. He's familiar with Ayn Rand, so he would be very opposed to everything I say and everything I believe in. He's an anti individualist. This is why he hates Ayn Rand. He's a collectivist, a collectivist, a tribalist. So. As an anti-individualist, he has to hate Rand, and indeed he talks about Ayn Rand-style capitalism, and Ayn Rand-style capitalism is horrible, and it's destructive, and it destroys, and all this other stuff. So he has these very negative comments on Ayn Rand. More than that, and this is, this was surprising, he's a Keynesian. You know Keynesian, Keynes, the, the, the statist economist. He wants, like Trump, this massive infrastructure spending, he wants a lot of government spending on infrastructure, and he says this is the time to do it because rates are negative. Now we should take on massive amounts of debt because rates are negative. <laughs> I don't know how long they'd stay negative. <laughs> I don't know how long they'd stay negative if, uh, if the government started borrowing these huge quantities of money in order to rebuild uh, the roads and the bridges. And his whole vision of capitalism is a soft capitalism. It's a status capitalism. It's capitalism with lots of government intervention, regulations, controls, manipulations. Steve Bannon is no friend of liberty. He's no friend of capitalism. He's no friend of the individual. He is, in his own words, an economic nationalist, and that puts him on my anti-list. He's a lefty. He is a lefty when it comes to economics and a righty when it comes to culture, and that combination is the most scary. By the way, and then I'm going to go to Nathaniel, I think this is going to be the most anti-abortion administration ever. I think they're going to make it a priority to try to stop abortions in America. And, and uh, if that scares me. Yeah, I know it doesn't scare a lot of you guys, but this is probably going to be a very religious administration, even though Trump himself, I don't think cares about abortion and Trump himself is not religious. Based on the people he's appointing, this is going to be a religious administration. All right. Nathaniel, you want to talk trade? Go ahead. That's not true. Let, let me just stop there, Nathaniel. Wait, 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 wait a minute. That's just not true. I mean, I chose not to make a lot of money. I chose to become a teacher. I chose to. I chose to do this, which I don't make a lot of money at. I don't make uh, because I love because I love what I do. For objectivists, for Ayn Rand, it's all about doing what you love doing. It's all about pursuing your passion. It's all about living the best life you can live. Money is just one feature of that. It is never in Ayn Rand's novels or in Ayn Rand's philosophy. Money is never an end in itself, and it's never primary. Go ahead. Well, I don't know what globalist means. I, I mean, this has become a term suddenly that everybody uses, this term globalist. What does it mean? Does it mean global trade? Global trade is wonderful. Global trade has made America rich. Global trade has made it possible for people to rise up from poverty everywhere in the world, including America. Globalist, in the sense of global trade, has made this world an exciting, thrilling, 
fun place to live in. I, I love the fact that I can get on a plane, go anywhere in the world. Uh, I love the fact that I can buy stuff from China, from Japan. They can buy the best, the best that there is in the world. Glo global trade has created more jobs in the United States, many, many, many more jobs in the United States than, uh, than if you limited trade. Trade creates jobs. So there are more jobs in the U.S. today because of global trade than if you did away with global trade. You'd see a collapse of the entire U.S. economy if you limited global trade. Now, if globalism means world government, you know, some government uh, that's set up to tell us what to do, then, of course, I'm against that. But trade, trade is good. International trade is good. It's a value added. It's win-win. Both parties benefit. America is far richer, far better, and has many, many, many more jobs because of trade with China and Japan and Korea and Mexico. Trade is a win-win. It is a benefit to Americans. And by the way, America doesn't trade. It's individual Americans who trade, and they're much better off for, being, for doing so. You're listening to The Radical. You're Ron Brook. We'll be right back. One more minute, one more minute. All right, here we go. And, uh, you know, so we're talking about uh, Trump's, uh, Trump's nomination, but really we're talking about Trump's agenda. And, and uh, there's a lot to talk about, it's, it, 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 about trade, and it, it shocks me that people don't get trade. Trade is one of the most fundamental, uh, fundamental of issues in economics. It, there's no economist really, no serious economist in the world today who is anti-global trade, who is anti-trade 
between people in different countries, between individuals in different countries. Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, 240 years ago, showed that protectionism doesn't work, that protectionism is bad, that trade, free trade, zero tariff-like trade, is what allows for wealth creation on both sides, both parties. It's a win-win situation, a win-win relationship. Now, um, Sean has been waiting on the line, well, almost nine minutes I've been keeping Sean on the line. Now, Sean has a, uh, I think this is the, the Sean. Sean has a, a show on M560 in Chicago right after this show. So listen, Sean's, Sean is terrific and, and exciting and passionate. So um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> pitchforks, guys, pitchforks. We're out with the pitchforks. <laughs> yep. Yep. I don't know. What is it? Economic nationalist. Economic nationalist. Yeah, he's, 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 a, he's a fascist, absolutely. Yep. Well, but, but also, imagine, but Sean, imagine if he, he really got the credit. Imagine if he got the credit. Imagine if the President of the United States now is making decisions for companies, where to move, where to produce, which cars to produce, how to produce them. And, and, I mean, that is fascism. If indeed Donald Trump impacted the decision of Ford Motors, that is fascism. That's not the kind of president I want. Yeah, yeah. That'll be a blast. That'll be a blast. I, I, I love it. I love it. And no way are you winning. I'm going to rip you to shreds. Thanks, Sean. All right. Uh, we got Reed who wants to talk about trade. Hey, Reed. <laughs> Do you have any doubt that I'm going to win? There's going to be a lot of yelling. I can guarantee that. <laughs> Okay, well let's let's go through let's go through the motion let's go through the through uh, the exercise right. So uh, we don't have a textile industry in the United States anymore because basically textiles are made in in Bangladesh and in China and in other places, um, and much cheaper. So Walmart can sell very cheap clothing in the United States, which we all benefit from because we spend less money in clothes. Now, what does that make possible? That makes possible more money in our pockets. So when we have more money in our pockets, we have two choices in terms of what to do with that money. We could either take that money and invest it, or we could take that money and spend it. Now, if we invest that money, that, in, that becomes basically capital for businesses who then expand and expand product lines that are not in textiles. Textile jobs are finished. They're gone. They're not going to be in the United States anymore. But they might expand jobs in Silicon Valley. So a lot of our investments go into Silicon Valley. Where we build new plants, we hire new engineers, we hire we hire more uh, software people. Now, if we were spending more money on clothes because clothes were still expensive because we had high tariffs, we'd have less money to invest in creating jobs in Silicon Valley. Now, we also have more money in our pocket, so we spend more. Now, what do we tend to spend more on? On higher value goods, on things like, I don't know, entertainment, like Hollywood. Well, most of the entertainment we consume is produced in the United States. There are huge numbers of entertainment jobs in the United States that didn't exist in the past. And they pay very well. If you can get one of the jobs, they pay very, very well. We also consume more electronics. Most of those electronics, even if they're not assembled in the U.S., are products of companies and ideas that do come from the U.S. So you get a lot of engineers, you get a lot of software people 
who have now jobs that wouldn't have had before. We produce SUVs better than anybody in the world. We don't produce little cars very well. but be, So we have more money now to, to buy SUVs. Now, that's just a simple example. You can run that. You can simulate that. You can run it any way you want. But the net result of trade is win-win. And all you do when you have nascent trade is you're multiplying that win-win by millions and millions of people. And therefore, our standard of living is higher because we're paying less money for the goods we consume and we have more money to invest and consume other stuff. And their standards of living is higher because they have new jobs and new industries and so on. Does that make sense? Yep. And, and, and again, you could, you could multiply this in so many different ways and think about how much an iPhone would cost if Apple really built it in the United States with American labor, union labor, right? That got paid, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60 bucks an hour. Imagine what an iPhone would cost in those cases. And imagine if, the, if it was cost, how your productivity would go down because you wouldn't have an iPhone. If your productivity went down, you would be creating less value. You might be fired. You might not have a job. Jobs, as productivity goes up, more jobs ultimately are created. All right, you're listening to your Ron Brooks Show. We'll be right back after this break. All right, this is a two-minute break. Well, guys, I thought I'd have the whole show to cover all of Trump's appointments, and I've gotten through, what, a couple of them. I haven't got the sessions. I haven't got a Flynn and, and uh, Mike uh, Pompeo, and, and by next week, they'll be all new appointments, and I won't, you know, so wait, I'm so behind. I need Sean's hour. Can you guys in Chicago give me Sean's hour? I need another hour to cover, just, just barely cover what I wanted to cover. So what I want to do is next show, I'm going to cover national security. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about Flynn. I'll talk about Pompeo. And I'll cover national security and, and other issues relating to national security and Donald Trump. Um, and Because I know there's a lot of questions about that. And, and do I support Donald Trump, Trump's more aggressive stance vis-a-vis -vis Islamic terrorists? Okay, but in the meantime, this might be a good way to end it. Jack wants to ask me about what an objectivist presidency would look like. Go ahead, Jack. I'm good. Oh, excellent. Good, good.
sure. Well, I, I have almost no time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put you I'm gonna take you offline, uh, Jack. Thanks for calling it. Thanks for reading the virtue of selfishness and giving you a plug here on the on the on the show. Uh, absolutely, we are we are being destroyed by an orgy of altruism, an orgy of uh, you know it's other people's responsibility to take care of me, and it's other people's responsibility to protect me, and this is what causes the trade barriers. This is what causes the immigration barriers. We live in a we live in a culture of fear, and we live in a culture that uh, resents success. And uh, this is not America anymore. I, I mean, I really fear for the America that I immigrated to. I, I I think it's disappearing quickly. What would an objective president what What would an objective presidency look like? It would be a presidency focused on liberating Americans. It would be focused on protecting the individual rights of Americans. So the whole orientation would be around how do we reduce government's burden on you? So I would, you know, you would cut subsidies to business, dramatically, dramatically, dramatically cut regulations and start wiping them out, wiping out regulations over the next, you know, couple of decades so that they really, over the next few years to really free up business. It would mean cutting taxes dramatically. It would mean getting government out of our bedrooms and out of our boardrooms and freeing up the American people. It would mean making immigration legal, having rational, legal immigration into this country. You can find a job. You should be able to come here to work. It means lowering tariffs to zero. Yeah, I would get rid of NAFTA. I would get rid of NAFTA and replace it with real free trade, not with high tariffs and restrictions and barriers and all this kind of stuff. It would mean freedom. An objectivist presidency would mean acting to promote and encourage and build a free country, a country that is respects individual rights, that is focused on respecting individual rights. That's what objectivism is about. That's what Ayn Rand is about. That's what the Iran Book Show is about. It's about protecting individual rights. Government is our servant, not our master. Just squeezed it in there. Thanks a lot.